Hey everyone, thank you for joining and welcome to our first Students to Industry event of the year, um, which is Kickstarting Your Careers. Uh, so today we've got basically an awesome lineup of guest speakers and a guest star host, which is going to be incredible. Um, but I'm just going to walk you through some of the webinar basics, which is always good. So um, hey everyone, basically first we've got how to use the Q&A, which, um, you know, I think everyone's been on Zoom or at least one Zoom call, uh, you know, last year or through all of this. But um, basically, we want to encourage you guys to ask your questions because we're putting these webinars on for you guys to ask your questions. This is for students, for teachers. So make sure when you ask the question using the Q&A function at the bottom that you say your name, what institution you're from, just so we can make it a little bit personal and give you a shout out, which is awesome. Um, and on that note, I'm going to kind of throw it over to our guest host, which is Jason Torrens, who is head of audio engineering at Collart and basically a, uh, a killer drummer. So um, Jason, over to you and yeah, good luck. Thanks so much, Shauna. Thank you um, and welcome everyone. So um, we have an amazing uh, group of people here today. So we have Lana Christensen, Talia Kaletis and Bridget Mulholland. Um, a fantastic, fantastic representation of um, gender diversity here today as well, which is just awesome. So um, as opposed to me doing a, you know, my knowledge description of each person, let's let's see what each of these uh, legends have to say. So Bridget, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, JT. Um, <laughs> yeah, so my name's Bridge. I recently just finished studying audio production at Collarts. Um, I've always been around music. I've always loved music. I've been a performer since I was quite quite young, doing gigs with my dad from about the age of 11. And as I got older, I sort of developed a bit more of an interest to see like what's on the other side of gigs and, you know, the behind the scenes work, the engineering side of things. So basically just um, networked, asked people to point me in the direction of where I can get some experience. Um, did a bit of experience at the Croxton band room just as a stage hand, but, um, learned quite a lot and then as I got older um I was kind of asked you know by mates oh we're doing we're doing a show can you just jump on the mixer and I was like yeah sure had no idea what I was doing pretty much just a guessing game but that encouraged me to take on some study and kind of fine-tune my knowledge as to what was there um and then I sort of found I'm actually quite interested in post-production and music production so um yeah, going to Coll Arts and studying kind of just opened up a million other doors for me. So now I'm, I'm fresh out of uni. I finished at the end of last year and currently trying to establish myself as a freelance sound designer. I'm doing a bit of, you know, music production on the side. I'm still engineering, live sound engineering, just keeping all doors open, really. That's awesome. Sound, it's a very varied um, platform very. that, you know, the, yeah, the whole portfolio career concept coming straight out of the box, which is good. So um, that's awesome. Talia. Hello. Um, my background is actually a bit similar to Bridget's. I kind of got in through music. I played from a really young age as well. And I started out with my studies doing a music degree as a, a vocal major. And then after that, I was kind of not sure what I was wanting to do. I ended up enrolling at SAE to study audio, but I had um, like a music recording in mind. So I kind of went in with that vision, not knowing anything about post-production post at all. And then we sort of started getting taught about it a little bit. And that's when I was like, oh, wow, I really developed an interest and a passion for it and finished my degree sort of focusing on that. Uh, my first job in the industry was actually in live sound as well. And then uh, about six months after that, I fell into post-production, working for Folklore in Brisbane, um, spent a couple of years there, and now I'm at Deluxe, but still contracting for both Folklore and Deluxe. And uh, that's uh, where I'm at now. That's awesome. Um, it's, it's funny hearing these journeys, isn't it? That you start off with a certain intention and then you 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 get exposed to a new passion and then head down a slightly different pathway, which is just yeah. awesome. Lana. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, once again, same kind of deal all through like high school and stuff. It's all, it was all I was always focused on music, uh, playing guitar, instruments, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it wasn't until like my final, you know, grade 12 where I, we, they opened up a course for basically uh, sound and lighting. Um, so this is where I was like, oh, I want to get into live sounds and what I want to do. So straight out of that, I went into JMC Academy where I got my bachelor's degree in auto engineering and sound production. 
totally mindset mm. same thing I think I'm going to get a live sound all through my studies I volunteered with musical theatre through my local theatre group I got into doing AV work for the Gold Coast uh, Exhibition Centre I was a show technician at SeaWorld uh, however it wasn't quite what I wanted to do it was always kind of post even through all that JMC it was always oh I want to do post I want to do post so I actually my first gig I suppose was actually location sound so I was a sound assistant for an independent feature film uh, where I met the production sound mixer, Stuart Waller, who's been a great mentor and a friend all through these years, uh, brought me on to my first paid gig, which was Puberty Blues Series 2 as a sound uh, attachment, which is wonderful and great. But once again, always post, always post. So I found out about afters through, once again, more mutual contacts and, yeah, went from there. Uh, graduated there, uh, yeah, lucky enough to get a um, sound internship and now I'm here, so and that's it. Just awesome, another great story there. For those of anyone out there who doesn't know what Afters is, could you expand on that? Oh, yeah, so Afters is the Australian Film and Television School um, here in Sydney. Uh, so they do uh, multiple courses in uh, not only sound post-production, but they also do um, directors and production producers and I believe music composition as well for film and television. I think what an amazing country we're in, apart from the fact that, you know, we're, you know, smashing COVID at the moment, um, the, this concept that, you know, out of all of us that are here, like I studied at Box Hill, um, you know, obviously I work at Collar and Bridget went to Coll Arts and then we've got SAE and JMC and then Afters as well. Such a broad range of um, education facilities that are all able to feed everyone into work, which I think is just amazing. So shout out to all of us. I think that's a really good thing in this country. So very cool. So um, one of the, I think the big challenges is like, you, okay, you go to study and we've all found that we've gone on this different journey how did you get into the particular industry you're in? Like, what was the, was there a pivotal moment or something that you did that got you into your work? Was I think for like, me, it know? was, it was more, I, it was more just, I needed to stop guessing what I was doing. Like I, when I was live sound engineering, like I'm in control of this band's show and it's all well and good to be like, oh, I was just guessing, pressing buttons. It's all good. But I'm like, if I want to expand in that, I need to actually know what I'm doing. So I think, um just trying to refine my knowledge and actually get some answers and know why i'm pressing these buttons that's probably my pivotal moment to like start some study yeah yeah absolutely um talia or lana was there a similar moment for you that sent you into your study or that you know possibly led you into your career in this yeah um mine was kind of like portfolio based and industry contacts because I I worked really, really hard on my projects while I was studying at SAE and I did a couple of internships as well. Um, the industry like liaison coordinator there reached out to me and she was like, I'm really impressed with what you've done. I've got an industry contact who I can, I can pass his phone number along to you if you're interested. And I was like, yeah, absolutely. That person ended up being Tom Keller at Folklore. And we just sat down and had coffee one day. And he said to me, um, the thing that had um, gotten him interested in meeting me was this, one of the projects that I'd done sound design for. It was like a, um, a sound replacement clip of a, a movie. I think it was Kill Bill. So it was kind of hand in hand, like uh, my portfolio from my studies at SAE kind of elevating me to be offered to meet someone in the industry. Yeah, that's, I see a common theme with that sort of a thing happening, um, you know, with us at Coll Arts. I, I know that definitely happened with Bridget as well. She worked very hard and smashed it. Um, Lana, did you have any sort of similar stories in this, in that same conversation, um, that same training? I don't know if I particularly had one kind of pivotal moment where I was like, you know, sound post reduction is where I want to go. I think it was more me, trying everything like so through jmc it was live uh, studio work live sound work they also touched on electronics um even business mm -hmm. and skills like that um but yeah i think it was more trying out everything before i actually worked out 
sound post production is kind of where I want to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so there's a couple of things mentioned in in these little conversations there. They're like uh, Talia, you mentioned the the portfolio concept, and that was obviously developed during your studies. So would we all, you know, think that that idea of when you're studying to really hone those skills and get some things in the bank, you know, get some movies in the bank, get some recordings in the bank, get some live sound experience. Um, th these are important things we would say yes for students to get get themselves out in the industry. Yes, yes definitely. definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. It's good to come out of uh, your degree with some sort of, like I said, post-production, it's good to have some, even if you take a film that's already been created and recreate the sound, it's just good to have that uh, portfolio basically behind you. So when you do go out and cold call um, in the studios or wherever you want to go, you can say, well, this is actually what I can accomplish. So, you know, can you teach me? Can we learn from this? Plus you yeah. want to be making the most of the resources you've got yes. while you're studying on campus. Um, definitely make the most of that as much as you can, because once you stop studying, I, I think some campuses, depending on what they are, might still let you come in, use the studios or hire out some equipment after you've graduated. But if that's not the case, you've then got to spend your own money hiring it out. So you might as well do as much as you can while you're there. Yeah, I Absolutely. agree. I and think I think it's yeah. uh, really important to kind of use your, use your time at, um, you know, while you're studying and stuff to just kind of show your, show your work ethic and show your skill set and show how willing you are to meet new people and take on new things. I think you want to try and establish your career while you're studying. I think that's a good mindset to be in rather than, oh, I'm just studying at the moment and I'll establish myself when I'm out into the real world because, you know, I, I'm working on something for the Mardi Gras at the moment and that's come from an impression I made on my post-production teacher. You've got to make an impression while you're while you're there and make the most of your resources and, and just show your enthusiasm and your passion for what you do because it, it, it will carry on once you finish. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, shout out to Steve Bodie there. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> absolute <laughs> legend. And um, the, I mean, this idea of, you know, uh, going hard while you're studying, it, it seems to be a common theme that's coming up that, you know, it's it's going to, you know, absolutely set you in stone towards heading places. Tali, you had that same experience as well, which I think is just a really good sign for for anyone who's like maybe not studying. Obviously, it's a good idea to study <laughs> because you do get exposed to so much more than you can imagine. And obviously, from that previous conversation, you also get exposed to things that you just don't know that you don't know, you know, like. Bridget was looking for live sound. Lani, you were talking about that as well. And, um, you know, oh, I'm heading in this certain direction. But then you go, wow, I didn't realize that thing was over there. In the meantime, you're developing your skills, which I think is just amazing. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I never thought I'd be doing this job. I never thought I, you know, I just loved Pro Tools and bands and all that. And next thing you know, I'm hosting an Avid webinar in Spain. <laughs> yeah, I'm right um, with you there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, Throughout this time, like, was, I mean, obviously we're, we're here in an AVID webinar, right? So we're going to talk about Pro Tools at some stage. Um, so how important was your skills in Pro Tools to, you know, to develop you as sound engineers? I think for me personally, it was uh, pivotal, pivotal, because AVID was kind of all that, you know, I, oh, sorry, Pro Tools, I should say. Um, you know, it's just what we what we what we learned on in JMC. It's what we learned on it afters, and it's now what I use in my freelance business as well. So um, I'm not because I never really went down that kind of music avenue. I haven't really used any other kind of software. It's always just kind of been Pro Tools for my post production work. So um, as much as you can learn, uh, it's the best thing that you can do. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, as I was leaving SAE, my Pro Tools skills definitely weren't the best. I was more proficient in Ableton because I'd be, I was more focused on sound design and I was using Ableton for that. And I'm yeah. definitely an advocate for bit, like, knowing multiple doors. But once I got into the industry as like an audio professional, Pro Tools is all we use. So I would definitely recommend knowing how to use Pro Tools, you don't have to be the best at it to get into the industry. You'll learn as you go, but you need to know at least the basics. Yeah. Um, so like an, another way to sort of look at this, I know um, we've got Glenn in the background there who might pop in later, but 
I've heard the stories about, you know, especially in post-production, right? Post-production, it's pretty hard to get by without knowing Pro Tools. And then in recording studios, it's a very similar sort of thing. But I've heard these stories about, you know, businesses that will get in all their resumes and there'll be two piles. There'll be the pile of like, you know, people that know Pro Tools. And then there's another pile, which is a round sort of storage device, you know, um, next to the desk for the people that haven't had experience in this program. So not like trying to just drill home the whole Pro Tools thing, but it seems like a very necessary thing in the industry. And I personally use Ableton myself. I play in a band, we play live, we run Ableton and Vision and all that sort of stuff. And um, it's impossible to do that in Pro Tools. So the you know diversity in doors, I think is really important. So, um, so Bridget, I know like you've got a Pro Tools certification. Did you feel like that was something that you liked doing? Like, was that helpful for you? Yeah, and I so in my last trimester at Collarts, you sort of start to focus on getting yourself ready for you know your career and you know doing redoing your resume and stuff like that. And that was something that just felt like so good to put on my resume, like I'm a Pro Tools certified user. And I agree with Talia in saying that you know it's good to be diverse and you know across different doors because um, you know there are other ones out there that people are using, but I find Pro Tools, whether it's music or post-production, I think Pro Tools is a big one. So if you can, um, you know, if you've got some kind of skill set in there, I think it I think it makes it a lot easier for you to land some work in the industry, whether you want to go post-production or music production, I think it's a good thing to have. Yeah, for what, sure. Um, i just chime in there. What you said yeah. very diplomatically as well, Jason, <laughs> about the two files. <laughs> I will, I will comment on that. We do, when I was in Brisbane working full-time at Folklore, we got a lot of people interested in coming to work with us and interning. And we did bring people in quite frequently. And to the people who didn't know how to use Pro Tools, there was a few. We just had to say, sorry, like we don't have time to teach you this level of basic audio. If you want to learn, if you want to go away and learn it and then come back, then we can chat but we need somebody who at least has that basic knowledge of basic audio knowledge and basic Pro Tools skills so that then we can go from there. If you don't have that, we just working in like a full-time situation, like we're very busy and we don't have that much time to, sh to show you from scratch. Yeah. And coming out, of, coming out of an audio degree, you should at least know that. But we also did have some like film students who were interested, which is great. I highly, highly recommend film students at least uh, just get to know stuff about audio because once you're in the industry, you're handing over to audio people and it is really frustrating getting a delivery from someone and you're trying to communicate with them and you, you guys just, you're in totally different worlds. And if, if they don't know anything about audio, if you don't know anything about picture, it just can become a really frustrating back and forth. So yes, it's really great to know like the basics there, but for us hiring an audio person, if you don't know Pro Tools, it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. And like, I think in that um, continuing that diplomatic nature, I think it's um, worth noting that just, you know, what, what all three of you would have learned in your studies, just about audio in general, as you mentioned, Talia, um, is all really helpful. Like, even if you know how to run a live mixing console and you understand signal flow going down a channel, and then you can then translate that information into Pro Tools, or you can understand, you know, if you know Ableton well, then that's going to help you to be able to move into Pro Tools or into live sound. So I think, you know, these general signal flow principles and understanding of audio in general is going to be a great stepping stone. So if it's, you know, if you're watching and you're like, I don't know Pro Tools, um, you know, I'll never make it, then no, it's just a case of whatever you've learned is going to help you when you get to Pro Tools. That's what yeah. I, would, I would expect anyway. Yeah, definitely. I started on Cubase and, um, you know, battled hard with that in the, the long time ago, like before I'm sure a lot of people who are watching were born, but um, <laughs> it helped me understand Pro Tools and then Pro Tools was just so much easier. It was so much yeah. better. Yeah. But yeah. If I could just comment um, on that, um, without it sounding too daunting for people out there who don't know how to use Pro Tools or anything, if I could just encourage you, like if, if you just have a basic understanding of signal flow, you find most doors have kind of the similar kind of flow and Avid does actually, actually offer like some fantastic um, teaching. That's how I got my certification at Collapse through like fundamentals of Pro Tools, which Avid offers and it's quite an easy way to learn how to use the software 
um, you know, you can do, you read your chapter, you do questions and you actually pick it up quite quickly. So if it is a bit daunting, just have a look out there and, and see what you can do because there are ways to learn and it, it's actually not as daunting as we might be making it sound. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I even think like, you know, there's that whole, you know, even if you're just into making beats or, you know, recording your own stuff, it actually isn't that much of a learning curve to get yourself rolling. And all of a sudden, the all those online educational tools you can find can just really give you a good head start. Absolutely. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, going to college and then uh, learning Pro Tools, um, these things are obviously going to help people get into the industry. But I also hear in this diplomatic sort of nature that I've heard people say, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll you know, entertain you for a, um, a, a job at this place. But there's sometimes things that are more important than just some Pro Tools knowledge. So would any, any of you like to expand on that? Like what, what do you think employers are looking for when it comes to um, engineers and producers and so on in this world? What else is being, necessary? Being approachable, like just being, I. I don't know why, but when, before I started studying Pro Tools and, you know, started to develop an interest in live sound, I had this weird mindset that you had to be like this tough guy sound, soundy, and it's just not the case. Just be nice to people. Just, you know, chat, get to know them, um, just open up and, you know, be willing to learn new things and put yourself out there and just, you know, don't be afraid of rejection. Like the worst that's going to happen, you just ask ask someone, oh, have you got any experience for me? Or, you know, do you have any work you can offer me? The worst that's going to happen is they're going to say no. And just, you know, don't let that get you down. Just just be, a, just be a nice person and be approachable. And I think, you know, regardless of what you know about Pro Tools or don't know about Pro Tools or anything, I think that can be like a big, um, a big stepping stone into the industry, just being a good person. Yeah, 100%. If you need to have, you know, like I said, be nice and be a good personality because People in the, in, at the end of the day want to be able to work with you. So especially if you're just coming out into an internship or something like that, um, be on board for criticism and take notes, like take everything on board because these are people who have been in the industry for, you know, many, many years and they have, you know, wise advice. Um, take it all on and be open to everything. Yeah, definitely. After I've just gone on that big spiel about Pro Tools, um, if <laughs> when we were looking at taking someone on board, if there was two people in front of us and one person had all the skills that we were looking for in an editor, but was arrogant. And then another person didn't have as much in terms of that knowledge, but was just eager to learn, shows up when we want them to show up and just absorbs and doesn't, you know, um, think they know more than you, then we're going to go with the person with the correct attitude. So it's definitely like, attitude is the most important thing because we're going to teach you on the job anyway what we want you to know yeah really really good points um i also hear that that uh re being reliable and punctual those sorts of things all seem to be uh pretty high on the list as well like good Basically, communication uh we want you to show up even if you've got a hangover i think that was a lot of the reason why <laughs> i uh, kept my job <laughs> I was there. If I was hungover, it didn't matter. If I was there working, great. Yeah. She was a bit slow today, but she was on time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, really, really, really good points. Um, so in a similar fashion to, I think, where, Bridget, you were talking earlier about this idea that, you know, saying yes to things is another thing I hear about um, for students trying to get in, out into the industry about um, if an opportunity comes up and you don't think it's in your bag or you don't know if you can do it, that idea of saying yes, like would anyone like to comment more on that? Like is, is saying yes really important when you're trying to get yourself out there? Yes. Very important. Yes. I agree. Because um, even if, you know, it, you think it's not really, you know, my interest, you're bound to learn something, whether it's knowledge that you need or not. If you just say yes to that opportunity, you're bound to take something out of it, even if it's just one thing. And it also helps you decide, oh, maybe I actually am interested in that. Or yeah, I'm definitely not interested in that. But you're bound to get some information out of it and you're bound to make networks. So always say yes. Yeah, mm. I I did that. I, it was all through out SE when I was studying as well. Like people, asked if I wanted to work on projects and I just said yes to everything. It got to a point where I did say yes to too much at one point in my final trimester. And um, I just ended up like outsourcing and putting a team of 
um, of newer students together and being like, hey, I've got this project. I'm going to be the lead, but I've got this work if we all want to collaborate. Obviously, like they got all the credit for doing it, but I sort of just oversaw it, made sure it was all good. Like, okay, cool. That's one less thing I have to worry about because I said yes to doing this project and I didn't want to be like, actually, I don't have time for you anymore. Um, so it was sort of a mixture of that. Plus, I, when I got into live sound, I definitely over embellished my knowledge and skills. <laughs> and I just said yes to that as well. And I was like, it's all right. I'll figure it out once I'm, once I'm working, which I did. So if, if you don't say yes to stuff, you're not going to have, you're going to miss these opportunities. Yeah. yeah. 100%, 100%. Same thing when I was working through my freelance business, as every project that kind of popped up, whether it be paid or free, I'm just like, yes, yes, I'll do it all, I'll do it all. But uh, like I said, trying to do all that and then working a job outside to pay the bills, um, you know, you kind of do late nights and you're up all night and you just think to yourself, well, I don't know why I did all this and I've got a deadline to meet. Um, so it's definitely a, a balance. I think that you have to work on for yourself. Yes. Say everything, say yes to as much as possible that you can, but at the same time, think about your well being as well, because it can get quite mm, that's daunting true. and, you know, yeah. tiresome for yourself. Yeah. yeah. I think it, there are yes, amazing points balance. and like, yeah, I, I like the fact that we've all said yes to should we all say yes, which is great. Um, but secondly, this like Tyler, your idea there, I think is brilliant. I, it sort of hasn't hadn't been that present in my head that if you are saying yes, and things pile up too much that then what you can do is say yes, and then ask for help, yeah. which is actually a really good point, you know. Um, and that actually segues quite well for me into this next conversation about like, when do you start charging? And so I'm sort of pre answering your question, maybe here by saying that if you have said yes to heaps of things, and like you said, Lana, that you yeah. say yes to paid things, you say yes to free things, when you've said yes too much, is that when the price goes up? Is that when you start charging more and saying, yes, I can do it, but now I need this much money? What yeah, are your thoughts? It's been quite a, a battle for me, exactly. You know, when do I start charging for my skills? How how long do I have to keep outsourcing my work for free? And, you know, you know, it's been, it's been a great battle. And even to this day, I mean, I still do um, volunteer and free projects here and there. If it's something that interests me and then I want to do it. And even if it has some potential to go to some international film um, festival, but, you know, obviously you can't come straight out of your degree thinking, Oh, I'm going to charge the highest rate possible for my work. Yeah. You definitely need to build up once again, that portfolio, and your work you need to build up your contacts and you know after a while especially when you have repeat people coming back with you know more short films or bigger projects and they start getting funding um that's a, a good option for you to go okay well i've given you years of you know free work and we've built up this relationship so now you've got the funding let's talk about price yeah sounds completely fair enough that there's and I think sometimes being really open about that in conversations, not being scared to actually say how much money do you have and, you know, can I get paid for this? You know, what's your budget? Those sorts of things. Seems like such a scary conversation at yeah. first, doesn't it's, it? It's definitely a big, it's a tough question to ask and, I, you know, I don't always want to ask it because uh, most of the time these are, you know, uh, like my fellow afters, uh, producers and directors and stuff, you know, we're all in the same boat trying to, you know, make, make art basically. So, you know, they don't necessarily always have money themselves, but you do definitely want to build up those relationships. So it's definitely a, a tough battle, but at some point you do have to go, okay, I'm now, whether I'm a semi-professional or professional many years, I need to start charging. So. Yeah. And I know there's been some, um, you know, there's lots of conversations about the don't try and undercut your other professionals and do things for super cheap because it undervalues, um, the role, but yeah, challenging conversation to have. I yeah. think, yeah, just be good to, at what you trying, do. Yeah, just trying Sorry. to work out what price you charge. That's another thing. Like you might start off with a yeah. lower fee, but as you, you know, progress in your career, you know, you need to start thinking about, you know, upping your price and getting up to an industry profession and finding those prices was, you know, it's still to the state to me, a, quite a challenge to work out what to charge. Yeah, yeah. So Completely just busy. quickly on that, yeah. When you're talking about what to charge, we actually just got a question from a James Carter, who's kind of asking, what's a reasonable hourly rate to ask for as a diploma or advanced diploma sound producer? So like what would be, say, 
if we want to go from that level to recent graduate to say if you've got a couple of projects like what is a standard hourly rate i don't know if yeah. there is a standard There's hourly rate not no. i no and that doesn't matter how much research you do online it's just so hard because not everyone says what their hourly rate is so you can base it off something that's possibly you know project by project mm. um you just kind of got to work out i think for me it was working out what your expenses are so if you're operating at a home studio what are you what's it actually costing you to run your setup run your system your subscriptions your plugins all this kind of stuff that you pay for um you got to start making your money back at some point so you kind of just got to work out your own individual budget i suppose yeah and a lot of the time they'll someone might approach you and be like uh you know we've shot this film it's getting edited now we've got fifteen hundred dollars left for sound or something like that maybe or whatever price and you have to you know maybe you can try and negotiate if whether they can find some more money if that's not enough for you or maybe it is you just have to sort of fit it, figure it out for your circumstances and and as you were yeah. saying like maybe you want to take on the project because you really believe in that project so you'll do it for a little bit less it's it's different every time yeah and if there's a set budget that they have say okay that's great i'm only going to allocate you two weeks to be able to do this because yeah. you can't be doing a project for months and months and months and you know possibly having that payment delayed and never receiving the money or you know all that kind of circumstance so definitely give yourself a time frame a reasonable time frame for you to be able to get it done with all your other commitments if you've got them yeah i think that's important to set a time with them make sure everyone's clear okay this budget you've got is going to get you two weeks of editing one week of mix yeah and and then go from there yeah yeah, maybe nice. it, it won't always turn out that way. Yeah. <laughs> it might not turn out that way in the end, but you know, to at least set some kind of standard yeah. so they're not expecting three months of editing. Like, yeah. you know, that's ridiculous. Yeah. And don't finish the project and then two months later come back and say, "Oh, I want to do this edit, re-edit, or you know, a remix or something like that." It's like, okay, that's that's fair enough. I'll give you three days and I'm going to charge you this for it. Yeah. So. Yeah, nice. Yeah. No, I just wanted to chime that in because you guys are talking about it and I'm monitoring no, the Q and A. We will get to your questions, everyone. Jason's just doing his thing and then we'll have some time at the end. So if we're not getting to it. We're not ignoring you. We will get there. Back to you, Jason. Yeah, cheers. Um, like I know the AASG, um, like was it Tali, you were talking about that earlier that had, that helped you get into your, um, oh, no, it was Lana, you said That's that? Me, yeah. Yeah, it was once again through uh, my contacts who suggested that I go to afters also suggested that I look into the ASSG because it's a great, because they do a, um, uh, was it a lunch, a lunch and award ceremony, I should say, um, every year. So it's a great opportunity to get into it and actually meet your fellow sound professionals because at the end of the day, these could be your fellow work colleagues, they could be your new boss, you never know who you're going to meet. So, um, so I did once again, through that contact, Stuart Waller on the sound production, he was there. So he introduced me to other production uh, post-production houses and the people there so I found I got to get you know get my name or get my face into these people's faces so they know who I am let them know that yes I'm attending afters next year I'm keen in post and you know hopefully they can you know take you from there or remember you next time that you contact them yeah would would you suggest because i've heard this amongst other guilds and other industries that they can also be a good community for you on advising on how much to charge for things or how long will it take for you to you know edit that film and then mix that film or depending on the length would that is would you say that's a good connection to make with those sorts of uh, guilds as well uh yeah definitely because with uh, ssg they send out monthly emails to you with uh, live talks with uh, colleagues or you know um, you know, high-end professionals in the US. I think we've had a couple of those. Um, but yeah, it's just a great place to meet people and you can ask those questions of these people who, you know, have done 30, 40 years in the profession. It's great advice mm. and yeah, yeah that great learning. That awards ceremony is a great yeah. networking event if yeah. you can get to it because yeah, everyone who's been in the industry for ages is there. Everyone's sort of having a few drinks, chatting. Everyone's really friendly and yeah yeah they'll have a chat to you about what it's like and if answering your questions so yeah. definitely happy to chat to that you. yeah and because we've sort of just skimmed past it what is the aasg <laughs> for those that a don't know ASSG. Uh, the australian sound screen guild yes so it's cool. uh not just post-production it's um uh location sound as well 
all those professionals basically a community meeting together and mm -hmm. like I said having the award ceremony um celebrating each other's work yeah. um through the awards so um yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. place so. generally appreciating sound yeah <laughs> yeah yeah you our fellow you know sound geeks essentially yeah, right? pretty much, <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome awesome um and I hear they have uh, like cheaper memberships for students as well. Apparently, that's something that was discussed earlier. Is that correct? Yes, I yes. believe it's thirty dollars for the year for students. There you go. So definitely another hot tip there. I think, which is really really good. Um, so obviously, we, we will head to questions soon. Um, are there any other like just extra things that you think that you know? getting yourselves into the industry because you're all actually out there doing some work now um were there any other things that you did apart from be say you know approachable know some pro tools you know what what were the other things in your education that you felt helped was there a good solid understanding of digital audio theory or was it signal flow are there any other hot tips that you think like a, a budding student should not you know miss that class when they're studying I think signal flow, like whether you're in post-production or live sound or music production, you, like signal flow is like the biggest thing. And once you understand it, everything sort of gels together and makes some sense. And I think um, if I could give anyone a tip of something that I kind of wish I did a bit more during my studies is use, use your resources a bit more. Like you have lecturers that have a million contacts. Just ask them, like just ask the question is, do, you know, could you point me to in the direction of where I might find some work or do you know anyone do you have any projects going like just ask the question and chase after it don't it's not just about saying yes to all the opportunities that come your way it's kind of about putting in the legwork and chasing after it yourself because again the worst that's going to happen is they, they'll say no like no I don't have anything going at the moment sorry mm -hmm. just ask and learn signal flow yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really good Talia or Lana any uh other hot tips in this field um, I mean, I think Bridget covered most of it. I think um, definitely another thing that I didn't utilise enough was using the resources, particularly at JMC. Um, you know, you use that and you, I should have, you know, explored more or, you know, whatever it is. And it's, it, you know, I was kind of juggling between trying to get out there and volunteer myself, also working part-time, um, studying, you know, utilize like Bridget said utilize your contacts utilizes your resources and build that portfolio because if you've got something to show of what you can do I believe it can really help you yeah I 100% agree mm -hmm. with that like if you've got a great portfolio that's awesome what you said earlier like way at the start Jason when you said you you don't know what you don't know really I think applies to me um because um like some of the things I I did well that set myself up well for when I was studying was obviously I was spending long hours on campus like 12 hours when I was there working on my projects like I made sure I didn't like my lecturers and my mentors could see that I was dedicated if they gave us a task I did it without complaining about it which like a lot of people did mm -hmm. like that's your lecturers don't want to hear you complaining about your assignments that's not why you're there I'm not why they're there um so I was I was present and on campus working really hard. I was there till midnight pretty much. Um, so that set me up well to be offered good opportunities like the internships. We had to do an internship to finish our degree. So they saw me really dedicating myself to my project. So they're like, this is a really great opportunity. I'm gonna put your name forward for it. But on the other hand, if I could go back to when I was studying and tell myself, hey, you need to learn this, this and this, there are some things that I would, I, cool. I should, like, I wish that I'd known going into a professional setting because as much as I, I put a lot of time and effort into studying, once I got into, into a professional setting where I had real world mentors and teachers working on real world stuff, there was so much I didn't know. So if anyone's listening and wants to get into like uh, audio post-production and film mixing and editing, I would recommend really getting your head around learning um, how a film mix session is set up with all the routing and the busing in a 5-1 in a setting because that was so we did touch on it a little bit while I was studying but because the studies were so broad like here learn a bit of post learn a bit of live sound learn yeah. a bit of this blah 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 it's like you get a little 
a little bit, but not all of it. That was something I really, really struggled with. Yeah. If you find something that you find that you really passionate about, um, use any spare time you got and expand your knowledge beyond your degree into that. So same thing with afters and stuff, you know, I found a passion for mixing. Um, however, because it was, you know, sh- such a short course, you know, I didn't get a chance to delve into that. It was just, you know, a little bit of a taste of this and that, but um, yeah. Yeah. So. Yes. The other things would have been apart from the film mix session set up Pro Tools plugin automation. That took yes. me ages <laughs> to figure out. And I had like, um, I was getting shown, like, I'd be like, oh, I've forgotten again. Can you please shout out to Sam and Tom who put up with so much of my, my shit <laughs> and my forgetting how to do stuff. Please show me this again. They showed me so many times. And eventually I was like, okay, it's actually pretty easy. <laughs> and um, ADR, setting up ADR packages to send out to clients was another thing. Like I was doing a lot of, and at, at the time I was just like, what is I don't know what that is, but yeah. okay. <laughs> there's so much you don't, there's so much you do cover in uni, uh, but there's also a wide, wide variety of stuff that you don't learn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I, I guess it, like, it's good to get on the job and learn, I suppose, as well. Yeah. So there's yeah, three hot it, tips. If you're looking to get into it, go figure out those. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like power core click is my favorite, you know, like, because <laughs> you know, I was going to say, if we're going to get super geeky and come, you know, say our favorite Pro Tools shortcut or something like that. <laughs> I'd do a shout out to um, Andy Hageman, who was uh, the main person who took me through my first uh, Avid qualifications, which I went to town on, by the way, and loved. Um, and he was all about the power claw The you know, he's making jokes about a little bear with the claw and stuff. And it was quite funny at the time, but holding down control option and command, you know, to click on a, a plugin thing to automate it yeah. and, you know, power claw again with the W to close all your Pro Tools windows. And I just remember those being like, oh, these are the moments. These are the, yeah. the little <laughs> tricks I want and they're going to save me time. Yes. Yeah. If you can learn yeah. those shortcuts as well, mm-hmm. it's a great asset to you because it just makes you all working in the daytime just so much faster so much faster and quicker i mean you don't need to know everything to be able to get the job done but it definitely helps you out immensely yeah yeah shortcuts yeah. learn them yeah. learn the shortcuts yeah i look yeah. that i look yeah. and I'm, you know bridget saying yes on that as well yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah I mean, we, uh, you know, we, I, I don't know, from a teacher's perspective, we harp on about the shortcuts quite a lot. We really try and drill them home. And I think that to me even relates to when you were talking about how much how much you charge, it's like, well, how much time versus how much money and the faster your workflows are means the more work you can get done. So if you're not constantly going to menus and doing things manually and you're flying through doing hits of shortcuts, yeah. you can get more stuff done. So yeah. that's so making, it, you know. Yeah, it's about you, if you just use the tools that are in front of you, I mean, you pick up the shortcuts relatively quick because, you know, some things you just use constantly. So, you know, you pick it up quick. So yeah, use what's in front of you. Yeah, yeah. and my- If I could, oh, sorry, sorry um, if I could yeah. comment on that, um, when I was doing my placement work at, um, at Collatz as like part of the last trimester, I was doing some work alongside Paul Parola, is just a sound design whiz, and I was only doing really simple tasks, but that that's like experience, real experience in the industry. And he was just grilling me about shortcuts the whole time because he's got he's got a lot of clients, and you know, time is money. And you know, he was giving me little projects to work on, and he's like, like, if it's going to take you five seconds to just go up and you know drag your mouse up and solo a clip he's like no he's like do it this way just drag click shift press s like just do everything quicker everything quicker because time is money in the industry so that's just like an example of real life experience in a real industry um yeah they want you to know your shortcuts so that's probably like shortcuts and signal flow yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. there you go <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, learning yes, learning your yeah, signal yeah. flow also feeds into understanding your mix sessions. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Those are uh, the, you know, mix sessions for a film that you were talking about earlier. I, I it's it really is a different thing in the post production industry, isn't it? It's a really it's a very specific sort of um yeah. setup which, you know, yeah, completely yeah. get is important. So yeah, definitely get that knowledge if it's not in your course, which is one of the other points I was gonna make is that you know, no matter where you study, that degree is going to put in what that degree thinks is right. You know, they're going to put in as much information as they can. 
but if the industry professionals were going to teach you everything that they knew, then your degree would go for like 12 years. Mm -hmm. So you can only learn so much in that time. And then you take what you can and you're going to get into the industry and they're going to show you their workflows and you're going to learn those. So, you know, stepping yourself out of those boundaries to try and get little extra bits of information, I think, and know your shortcuts and your signal flow um, yeah. is definitely, you know, do as much as you can, like you're, yeah. like you're all saying, which I think is fantastic. And definitely learn how other people, like professionals, learn how they do things and take what you like from that and um, add it into your own thing. Like making a mix, mixed templates for yourself, um, hmm. you know, yeah. test and try what other people do and take what you like and put it in your own template. Yeah, absolutely. I remember using Pro Tools for a very long time. And then when I started um, being exposed to like Dan Murtar and, um, you know, the Andrew Shep's workflow, that side of things as well, and Forrester Savile and so on in the, in the music mixing. And they were just like, the mix window? Who uses that? You know, like it was just <laughs> all in the edit window. And I was like, oh, this is yeah. amazing. Just the way they set it out. And like that just changed my life. You know, it was like, this is, this is really good. I can get rid of that second monitor now, you know. Like, <laughs> Or just make my mix window cover both. But anyway, any funny stories, any really like fun stories uh, throughout your journey so far? Ooh. No, I did, I did not prep you for this question. Not that I prepped <laughs> you for questions, but I know you have any webinars done, fun? I'm going to think of like 10. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, actually, um, on the spot, I'm like blank. Nothing, <laughs> nothing comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I've, I've had a lot of um, experiences like just, you know, something's not working in the studio or something. It turns out to just be like the most obvious thing ever. Oh, okay, I've got one. It's probably, it's going to embarrass me, but whatever. <laughs> I was, um, I had a couple artists come in for a project. I was recording, I think I was recording vocals and guitar or something. Anyway, I got into the studio about an hour beforehand, got everything set up and I couldn't work out why they couldn't hear me through the talkback mic through their headphones. I actually couldn't hear anything. And I was checking everything. I was going like right into Pro Tools IO, checking everything was correct. I was, um, you know, checking their headphones and everything. And I ended up chasing Dylan, who's like, you know, uh, one of the lecturers at Coll Arts and he's just a whiz with that kind of thing. I went to the front desk. I'm like, can you help me find Dylan? Like. Uh, like we should be recording by now and I can't figure this out. And, you know, they run around, chase around, found Dylan, came in and he was like doing the same thing as me as going deep into Pro Tools, like trying to figure out like it was really strange why it wasn't working. And it just turned out to be that the headphone thing wasn't plugged in properly. Like yeah. check everything and it's going to happen every now and then. It's just like yeah. just stupid things that like don't feel bad about it. It just it just happens. Yeah. Like you just miss little details and you're like, I was so yeah. embarrassed. I was like, oh my God, I'm so Dylan, like just wasting your time. Yeah. Same but, um, story. Yeah, yeah. Same <laughs> same story and it just comes down to a mute button. Yeah. Yeah. Mute button will get you, <laughs> you, you, get you every time. time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I even had the whole um, you know, the artist just going, I I'm not hearing myself very well and it doesn't sound right. And even I was baffled. I'm like, this just doesn't make sense. And then I turn the microphone around the correct way so the cardioid is facing their mouth as opposed to the other side of the room. And I'm like, yeah. I run an audio it's degree. Something, something something obvious. Oh, it's so, so easy to miss those simple things or forget, you know, just, you know. Yeah, especially yeah. when you're high, high pressure and time sensitive, you know, you overlook these little things that, you know, in any kind of regular case, you would, you know, get an instant, but it's just the pressure and the stress sometimes you just overlook these small, tiny, little embarrassing things. Yeah. You overthink it. You think it's something overthink, like really yes. technical, but it's actually just, oh, actually your cable's just not plugged in right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Little playback <laughs> engine. Oh my gosh. How many times has that got me? Like, oh my gosh, why is nothing working? Yeah. Oh, playback. I've got the wrong thing set in the playback yeah, yeah. engine. You're yeah. sitting in front of a massive recording studio and you're using the, the, the MacBook speakers, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> But they become like the first things you check next time that problem happens again. And like the more yeah, yeah. the more that happens, the more stupid mistakes you make, the the quicker you learn to problem yeah. solve. So don't feel bad about it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that that whole um concept of being okay with screwing up and failing, because it is only a learning experience. That's all it is. It's just okay. Yeah. You know, as Bridget said, I know to check that next time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is it It'll be the yeah. first thing I check. <laughs> That was good advice I got throughout my degree is while you're here learning, it's the best time to fail. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you learn from your failures and your mistakes. And once you get into the real, real world, you don't necessarily have that leeway to do that. So try, fail, succeed, and try again. I mm. think. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so before we head into some uh, question and answer, I, I, I sort of prequeled this at the very start of the webinar, but I think it's just an amazing and awesome thing that we have um, three ladies on board here today talking about their lives in this profession, which is amazing because it is very much a male dominated or it has the perception of being a male dominated industry. Um, do you do you, any of you have, you know, comment on that? Obviously, you're all in the industry, which is fantastic. So are there any, do you see trends changing? Do you have any comments on that? Um, I guess I, think- I was quite surprised coming out into the industry. I think the more technical side and live sound, yes, definitely you find a very male dominated presence. But when I went into post, I was actually surprised of how, like at the first ASSG awards that I went to, of actually how many females were actually in the industry. Um, even during afters, we had more girls than guys. So I think it depends more on where, what type of place you are. But um, at the same time, just because you're a female, don't be afraid to get in there and get dirty. Like they're, yeah. you know, command a respect in your room and you'll be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I was, I consider myself super lucky to have had the opportunities in the background that I had, like when I started out, it was just, I've mentioned Sam and Tom a, co- a couple of times. They're the directors of folklore and they've been the most amazing mentors and friends to this day. So when we started out, folklore was just a, very much just a startup company we were working out of their houses for maybe a year before our studio was built in West End and it so yeah it was just us three and then as the studio grew we were able to take on more people and they were always wanting to keep um, the environment diverse hire like bring on other females into the company to train up as editors so I've never experienced a, and, and Glenn as well, yeah, who's sitting Glenn. here, has always yeah. been a huge advocate for diversity. I have never experienced what I would consider any discrimination or felt like I was excluded yeah. or wasn't getting any opportunities. And I feel very lucky for that and yeah. thankful to Glenn and Sam and Tom. So yeah. it has been a really... That was working in AV. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't particularly feel like I was given the time or day and the attention, um, you know, to learn and you know get get in there um but definitely post-adduction and stuff like that it's just i haven't had any issues since so yeah so good but if you know Bridget, if you you had a story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah i think i think it's more just that perception that it's a male do- like audio is male dominant i think it's the perception that probably scares people more than anything and it did scare me before i started studying at collats and i was just kind of doing experience at the croxton they were all guys there, like, and, you know, when the bands came in, you know, they were always talking to the guys and I kind of felt like a, a bit of an outsider and it kind of scared me off a little bit. But then when I started at Call Arts, like the amount of girls that want to be doing live sound, want to be recording bands and doing post-production, it's actually, it's actually quite diverse. So I think if I could, you know, if there's, you know, any girls out there that find it a bit daunting, I think just, you know, work hard. Um, don't let that perception scare you because it's, it's not, it's not always right. Um, there's a lot of place for, you know, there's room for women out there and there's, a, you know, more and more women getting into the industry. Like, just don't let that perception scare you. Just work hard, learn your stuff, show them what you've got and don't don't make it um, a thing about trying to make a point like women are better than men in the industry. Like men are kick ass at the industry as well. It's about like equality. We want, you know, we want everyone involved. So that, you know, go and be a nice person, work hard, show them what you got um Mm. yeah it is just a perception thing don't don't let it scare you yeah yes actually i was terrified when i went into live sound because that was yeah so heavily male dominated i was the only female tech at the um at the place i was working at and um yeah it was scary and i definitely feel like i oh what's the word i kind of wasn't as maybe not outgoing as i could have been like i maybe you know let myself get walked over by some of the band members sometimes or whatever but like I, and that's something that's a personal thing you've got to overcome as well yeah. you kind of just have Take to on the chin. yeah like yeah. you just 
be a bit more commanding, yeah. I guess, if you have to, and just be like, try and keep gender out of it. Like, hey, you need to turn down, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is difficult That's such at a first. Good point. Yeah, yeah, take gender out of it. Um, yeah. When, when I've gone into a gig and, you know, because like, I'm still doing, I'm still mixing bands most weekends now and, you know, the bands roll up and see a female, like I kind of get this vibe. They're like, oh, shit, it's a girl. It's a girl doing our sound. <laughs> and then you just go up and just talk to them like normal. Yeah. Don't like, don't bring gender into it. Just be like, hey, going like, you know, what's your setup? What can we do? Yeah, I can do that for you. No worries. Just, you know, that thing about being a nice person again. And then yeah. they come around and they actually, you know, after the gig, they come up like, thank you, you did a really good job. Yeah. Like, got nothing to do with the fact that you're a girl or a guy. No. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Just keep that, be, keep being personable to everybody. Be, yeah. Don't have to be likable, but, you know, um, yeah. you come into the room, you know your stuff, you know, you're there for a reason. And for them, most of the time, um, everyone's lovely. And, yeah. you know, I find yeah. sound people quacks. So I actually learn a lot yeah. from my male counterparts. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And during live sound as well, like some like band members were surprised sometimes. But not like it's not like that all the time anymore. It's just like, oh, you're the sound person. Yeah, cool. Well, this is what we've got. Blah 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 blah. I did used to get some people come up to me while I was setting up the stage and be like, "Hey, are you the DJ?" <laughs> no, I'm dressed in all black and I'm setting the stage up. I'm obviously the tech, but um, it's mostly all good. Yeah, I had that That's too. Cool. I'd, I'd be doing. I'd be doing the sound. I'm the sound girl and the lighting guy next to me. People would come up and be like, oh, can, can you turn the kick up a little bit or oh, the guitar's a bit loud? I'm like, oh, I'm doing the sound, actually. Yeah. <laughs> He's doing the light. Like, there's just this assumption that guys are the sound guys. Like, yeah. I think, you know, just get in there. Us girls need to get in there and, you know, work yeah. alongside them. Yeah. Yeah. These are such great conversations to be having. It's really um it's awesome. It's really good. And thank you for all of that. Um, so Shauna, are we maybe ready for some questions or are there any other things that you, um, anyone else wants to talk about before we dive into these questions? I think it's been a really good discussion today. I'm enjoying it. So. Yeah, questions. Yeah, no, this has been it. awesome. Good questions. Question time. All right. Question well, time. here's a really uh, easy uh, one from Andre. <laughs> um, Talia, Lana, what desk are you sitting behind currently? This is a D control. Nice. Um, yes, it's which is essentially a, a massive, a massive mouse um, much, yeah. <laughs> controller, like the the S six that Colarts just bought recently, which is in a really expensive mouse, <laughs> um, and it, it allows you to have tactile control of Pro Tools, essentially, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 No, nice. I just thought I'd get the easy one kind yeah, of out of the that. way. A couple of these are long, but we love this. So thank you again, everyone, for, for watching and engaging and awesome session, Talia, Lana, and Bridget, uh, and Jason. Um, great. It's been great. Um, and I think we've had a lot of advice, you know, especially <clears throat> the last comments there around kind of diversity in the industry. We've got International Women's Day coming up on the 6th of March, I believe. I could have it wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's it. So it's, yeah, it's just kind of good to to talk about that. But I think, yeah, your tips are there, just kind of removing gender, getting in there, just being personable, just being a good person, getting the job done, having that experience. You're good to go. Um, so on that note, we've got a couple of questions here um, from a couple of people. So I'm going to try and just generalize this. But basically, what opportunities, like with COVID, there's a lot of people who have, say, finished their degrees last year or the year before that, and then they've noticed with COVID, there's been kind of like a delay or um just kind of a getting that experience or internship so what tips and advice would you have for people during this time like you know how do you apply for an internship who should you reach out to how do you attend networking events that aren't going on at the moment like what what's the best way that you guys can think of doing that um i mean if you can't work on something learn um develop your skills on the downtime that you do have because you know you're not necessarily going to have all the time in the world to learn this. And when you do get that internship or some sort of work experience or a job, I mean, it's great just to come in and know what you need to know and get it done. Um, same thing with the ASSGs. They actually do, I think it's a monthly a Zoom chat. So if you are a member, um, you're welcome to join on and, you know, you can make contacts that way. Um, but, yeah, it's just that, that battle of uh, cold calling people and seeing what's out there trying to get your name out there and yes you're gonna get many 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 rejections because you know it's not always work going on especially during now with covid 
um, it's really hard, but you just got to take it on the chin and just keep going and just learn everything that you can. Yeah. Even call up and say, Hey, um, I've I recently graduated. I'd love to shadow you for a day. Yeah. If I can sit in the, mm. in the corner and just observe, um, and maybe they'll say yes. Yeah. Mentorship, for instance, mm. like, um, you know, oh, I'm a big really... advocate of, um, yeah. of mentorships. 100%. I think that's, there's, that's brilliant. There's people out there that will want to train up the next generations of sound mm. people. They're there. You just got to find them. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, Bridget, nice. I guess, considering you're also a, um, like a recent graduate, like you finished your degree last year and I know you've kind of just spoken about all the work you've got. And I think that goes hand in hand with the amount of effort that you put in to your degree as well. Like, you know, you, yeah. you reached out to your teachers, you got the experience, you got Prozal certified, all that kind of stuff. But during this time, have you found it a little bit more difficult to make those connections or kind of get new work or anything like that? I think, uh, I think at the start of, COVID, it was, it was definitely daunting, but I, I look at how quickly, you know, schools and companies and, you know, small businesses have adapted to this situation. Everything's, everything's over Zoom now. Um, there are ways, and, you know, I learned this quite a bit during my studies, there are ways to um, accomplish what you want to accomplish remotely. Um, you know, it's, you can do the old school way of just like calling someone or have you got any, any work for your emailing? Like you can still be doing that during this tough time. And then it's just a matter of, um, communicating via email, via phone. Um, it's really easy to collaborate on projects remotely now. Um, yeah, it was a bit daunting, but I think we're we're adapting. And I think there's, you know, even this event right now, this is like um, a perfect example of how people can still learn about the industry and get to know new people and get some tips and stuff while we're in this pandemic and, you know, while, you know, a bit restricted from actually going out and getting real life experience. I think just... Yeah, do the old school way, get in touch, see where it takes you. I also think it's probably easiest to get into live sound because, and this is what I did, I just started rocking up at this venue. Um, I did get introduced to the manager and he was like, okay, yeah, look, if we've got any opportunities, I'll keep you in mind, blah, blah, blah. But I sort of like went to the techs on the nights when the bands were playing. I was like, hey, can I help you out? I'll like roll cables with you. I'll help you set up. I'll help you pack down. And I wasn't getting paid but I was just there. I was rocking up, helping him out, having a chat. Sometimes they'd hand me the iPad and be like, here, have a mix. And then uh, an opportunity came up. Somebody, I think got fired and they were like, Hey, we have an opening. I, I just got a phone call when I was like, he was like, Hey, look, I need someone tonight. Are you available? And I was like, yep. And that's how I just had a job in live sound after that. So <laughs> I'm not yeah. necessarily saying that'll work for everyone, but if, if you can and you're interested in live sound um give it a go just yeah. rock up and be like hey can i just give you a hand i'll roll roll some cables for you yeah um and yeah and that's even then you've got a job in or you might get a job in live sound that's a stepping stone into the audio industry and that could yeah. take you further did yeah same thing because what i was doing was volunteering at my, my local theater group um that was a great way for me to learn because it was literally just me with you know some of the stage hands that were there but you know I had to do the sound you know it's not it's not perfect because you know it's amateur theater and you know the equipment's not always the best but you're there and you're solely responsible for the sound and the the show that's going on so it's at, I found that an absolutely massive learning experience for me plus yeah. live sound is character building oh my yeah. word yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it will it will give you some thick skin yes, so. <laughs> yeah. and you, you need that thick skin yeah. sometimes yeah um, yeah so um yeah i recommend giving that a go maybe no nice um and kind of based off of that as well but uh jason this might be a bit more towards um towards your area uh you know being an awesome teacher but uh, this one's from Brittany and she just goes, you know, do you have any advice for students who may be feeling overwhelmed while trying to choose a career path um, and figuring out, you know, which way they want to pursue? Because as you know, and I think, I mean, I personally went through this when I was leaving high school and going into um, university. I was like, well, I just, I don't know all the different pathways and all the different areas. And then you enter into your degree and then you realize how many there are. So what would be, say, your advice for a student there? Um, I'd say my advice is to like get as much as you can from your teachers and your studies like you know these three legends have been saying today and just keep going with them and it will eventually work itself out 
you know, like um, even in my experience, I started learning audio engineering. I had mentors and so on. I hadn't studied yet. And I found myself realizing that I'm, you know, more in the tracking and the teaching and setting up studio side of things than being a good mix engineer. It was a little heartbreaking for me when I realized I wasn't very good at that. There's people that were better. But I found I found my zone and found my joy in that. But it took a long time to find it out. So I think like um, these ladies are saying, it's just saying yes to so many things and then eventually working out what it is that you want to do because it will, it will become apparent at some stage. You know, Bridget started the degree wanting to really focus on live and fell in love with post-production. Talia and Lana have had similar stories of, you know, starting in some area but ending up in a different one. And I think that's just, that's just part of the journey. You know, you, you don't know what you don't know and you're going to find it eventually. Try a whole bunch of things and just keep trying to succeed at all of them. Because I think the final piece of advice in this long little answer <laughs> is um, that even if you don't really think you're going to enjoy live sound, you're going to learn so much in live sound that's going to help you in post-production, it's going to help you in the studio, it's going to, all of those little things all help each other. Yeah. So, and I reckon don't don't pressure yourself that you have to have the answer now. You don't have to have it figured out now and you don't have yeah. to reject an opportunity just because you're like not sure if it's what you want to do. Just just take it and then decide. You don't have to know what, you, what how your life's going to pan out right now. Yeah, actually mm. when I was studying, I had no interest in live sound at all. Um, <laughs> but the opportunity came up and it was a job in audio. So I was like, yeah, all right, yeah. I'll give it a go. Okay. Hey, and it was... A it was fun and it was a learning experience. So it turned out to be really good. Yeah. But yeah, as you're studying, I would agree. Give it all a go. You will figure out what you don't like, like I did. And we had to try, we had to try a bit of everything in my course. And I was like, oh gosh, location sound. No, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, you, you'll figure it out. Yeah. Trust your instincts and find out what you're really passionate about. Yeah. I think yeah. your point there that as opposed to you figuring out what you do like, you actually figure out what you don't like first. You you oh, start yeah. <laughs> taking things off the list, you know, yeah. like process of elimination. Yeah, exactly. So eventually there'll be something left and you go, oh, I guess I'll like that. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, yeah. that's one way of looking at it. But no, I, I like that. And I think, yeah. um, I forget who mentioned it before. I think it was more of a conversation earlier, but you know, if you're, you know, mad on audio and that's that's all you want to do, that's all you want to learn, but also kind of branching out and reaching or, or lo getting a better understanding of, say, the the video side or the film side or TV or whatever it is, mm -hmm. and, and learning how they work and what their workflow is, so that you can work in a, you know, a collaborative environment when you get into the industry. I think that's also um, really really good to know. And I, I don't know if that's more within your course or that means kind of, you know, stepping out then and kind of researching that on your own, but. Um, yeah, whoever brought that up earlier, I think that was a really, really great point for sure. Yeah. I've definitely had yeah. students who have finished the degree and then found themselves getting work in AV or, or that sort of industry and then just saying, oh, gosh, I just fell in love with getting projectors to sit perfectly. And they just they just went down the vision train after that. You know, they were like aspect ratios and they were just spitting out all this stuff I didn't understand. <laughs> but they found their passion, you know, in vision after doing audio. So, you know, you never know. No, yeah, on that true. as well, if I can make one last comment on it. I think in my course, we had to do an elective at the end. I don't know if it's the same with all of them. Um, an elective outside of our discipline and if you're at that stage and you're thinking you're going to go down a certain path like just audio post say because that's what I did um, do an elective in that area like film so you have an understanding of a little bit of an understanding it's only like one mm -hmm. class say but um, of what what it is they're doing on their end and hopefully um hopefully the film people are doing the same thing so that you guys sort of like, oh, I, I sort of know what they're doing so that when you are working together in a collaborative environment, you, you sort of have that understanding, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, a bit of everything because yeah. especially video and audio, um, you know, it's, you work, it's hand in hand. They kind of work together. They send you stuff, you send them stuff yeah. sometimes. So it's good to know the other side of it, even just the basics. Yeah. So if they come back with questions or whatever, or, you know, they want to know something about you or you know what you do you know you've you've got that to be able to communicate to them 
Yeah. And it makes it less awkward when you're on the phone with the picture yeah. editor and you guys are trying to work out the problem and you're like, well, I've got this problem. And they're like, well, what is that? And they're like, oh, I've got this problem. And you're both like not understanding the problem. Yeah. You know, like if you, if you have, if you guys have a little bit of knowledge of what the other person's doing, it makes it a lot easier. No, I think that that's great advice there. Um, I know I ran into mm. some issues like that before, even throughout my degree, when, when we started collaborating with some of the other departments, I'd be like, what do they want from me right now? <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it is good to learn, but um, I guess on that as well. So we've got a lot of questions about portfolios and it's kind of like, I think one of the things um, to know is how to present your portfolio. So, you know, is it a five page document with your entire life spiel? Is it a five minute to an hour video reel? Is it something that's super quick and just has like, is it a one pager? Like how would you guys, what would be your advice there? If someone was creating their, their portfolio, it's a one page document to give to someone, what do you put on it? If it's short, sharp and shiny, they're gonna yeah. get like a lot of portfolios. And you know, uh, I did a, like a showcase for post-production that was just like little snippets of different, um, you know, scenes from movies or just showing like uh, different skill sets, but just like 30 seconds to a minute of one video and then move on to the next thing because they haven't got all day to just sit there and watch like a 15 minute show reel yeah. of all your work. And same for like a resume or whatever you feel you're getting into, just keep it short, put your best work at the start because if they lose interest and you leave all your best stuff at the end, like you might miss out. Um, yeah. yeah, just get to the point. 100%, especially with show reels, same thing, resumes. But Cheryl's in particular, uh, short and sweet. Like I don't think anything more than five minutes. Just you got to present your best work first. Just get it out of the way so you can actually showcase your talents. Because like you said, the, someone at a studio is not going to sit there for 15 minutes watching your video. And if they don't like it in the first, you know, three minutes, then, you know, it could be their loss. You never know. But hmm. short and sweet. I like a website. That's what yeah. I did for mine. <laughs> Sorry, I made a Wix site. Um and just had like one tab for my um, sound replacement videos I'd done. And you can set it out however you like. And that's how I've enjoyed seeing other people's work. Anytime we've had people, you know, sending us their resumes and their portfolios. Um, it's great if there's just like a one page document. Here's some of my experience. Um, here's my studies. Here's a link to my portfolio. Yeah. Maybe it's a Vimeo. Uh, a video on Vimeo or maybe it's a website um, as long as it's as long as it's not convoluted and difficult to navigate through uh, you should be pretty good yeah, yeah. I, think so. I think some sort of digital footprint yeah especially in these days so this if you send an email for instance you can just click on the link and they've got all the information there ready and handy for them to view so. yeah yeah, and, and not multiple links. I don't want right. to be clicking on multiple links. One link, if that leads to a website with different pages and tabs and stuff, that's cool. Or yeah. if it just leads to Vimeo with your with your three minute or five minute, whatever, real. Yeah. Yeah. Make it easy. Don't don't yeah. make it yeah. hard for someone to do that. Cause yeah, like you say, if it's if it's more than kind of a, a five minute video reel or something like that, if it becomes too difficult, people are like, all right, now next. Yeah. 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 Um all right, I've got an interesting question here from uh, from Glenn Franklin, actually. And again, Jason, I might might shoot this one over to you. But is there any advantages or disadvantages of being a complete online student? So say you're doing an audio engineering degree, because he's mentioning how, say, Berkeley Online, for instance, can deliver that course completely online and you don't need to go on a campus. Do you feel like there's a disadvantage between that for students? Um. Look, it's, uh, you know, obviously we, you know, CollArts at the moment is now delivering fully online courses as well. And with the pandemic, I'm sure there's a lot of places in the world that had to do what we do, which is just flip. And how do you, like, how do you teach Dolby Atmos online? How do you teach live sound mixing online? Um, so I would look at what they're actually doing and seeing if you're getting some experience in that. Because, um, you know, I mean, that's what we're doing at CollArts. We've got students con con remote controlling Digico consoles from Mexico or wherever they are. We have um, students getting Dolby Atmos binaural feeds home and they're controlling the S6 from home. Like all of that sort of stuff is possible. The one thing I think you're probably going to miss out on is just that tactile feeling and, um, you know, of actually touching consoles and do doing that sort of work. But 
you can then go, you know, ensure that you get a bit of that by going to your local venue and doing live sound or, you know, trying to shadow someone and being in, in the room with them, you know, like Talia and Lana were suggesting earlier. So really, I think your skill is going to come down to what you actually do. And I think it's still possible to do it online, but getting into the room and getting some real practice um, at some stage is still important. Yeah. No, hope that great. Sort of answers the question. Um, we've had some, we had um, some of our most amazing work, like even like Bridget and um, Chris, another one of our students who were literally doing our Dolby Atmos subjects in the heart of lockdown last um, last year. And they produced some of the most amazing Dolby Atmos mixes, like full, you know, surround amazing adventures. And there was like 20 of them smashing it out of the park during complete lockdown. Can be and done. So, it can be done. Exactly correct. Like, you know, Bridget's smiling because she was one of the people in that where we're like, how are we going to do this? You know, us teachers worked it out and the students just stood up to the plate and literally smashed it out of the park. It was impressive. So it's possible. Yeah, nice. we ran a live event, you know, like the other thing, like, you know, um, I'm not trying to pump up Cole Arts tires here, but this was like showing what's <laughs> possible that we ran a live event at the end of last year where a bunch of us teachers were on stage playing, COVID safe, obviously, and um, the the lighting, the camera control, the fallback mixing and the front of house mixing and the broadcast mix was all controlled by students in different parts of Victoria, like Shepparton, Colac, you know, all different suburbs, and they were remote controlling into the campus and you, faders are moving, lights are moving around in the room, cameras are panning and stuff, all streaming live to Facebook, and the room was empty, apart from us musicians. So okay. that's, that's cool. what's possible. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully that answers your question. Yes, you can do a degree online. I believe so. <laughs> yeah. No, awesome. I um, that, that is really good. And you mentioned... Um, kind of Atmos and surround sound. And there's a question here from Vanessa, uh, who's kind of asking, you know, what do you think the music industry will look like in the future from your POV? And I think there's a lot of really cool things in development and kind of new things in music and in sound. So, you know, say in the next five, 10 years, what do you guys hope to see, I guess, or, or what is it going to look like? The music well, industry? Like surround sound. Kind of like music. music or sound. Yeah. That would be cool. That could be done. I don't know. I think the exciting thing is you don't know, like, you know, when like a new track comes out, you're like, oh my God, like, or a new artist and they've just got a new style. You're like, cool. <laughs> like you couldn't have picked it, couldn't have like predicted it. Like just, I don't know. We just keep evolving. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe like binaural mixes for music and like you hear like drums and stuff moving around or like, you know, synths and stuff like above your head. I don't know. You could go anywhere. Yeah. Integrated with VR probably as well. Yeah. Like some yeah. kind of immersive experience like that. I'd love for everyone's home, I guess, viewing rooms, their TVs and stuff for completely fully Atmos and <laughs> fully immersive. Yeah. That, would be, that would be pretty cool. That would be cool. So, you know, yeah. we could actually, actually do all this work and this exciting mixing and, you know, uh, production that you work on and then people can actually listen to it at home, mm. especially yeah. with cinema kind of dropped off a bit lately and, you know, you need to you need better watch this stuff and watch all the uh, creative stuff that you do in your company, your home, on own home, that would be cool. But hmm. yeah, I agree, and I I think that's where it's heading. It's where I know Dolby are you know aiming for it to head, and then you've got Amazon Music who are you know remixing a whole bunch of material in Dolby Atmos. Um, and there's all I mean, there's also the whole you know if we go back a bunch of years, a couple of decades when they did start doing music in five point one, and it didn't work, you know, like drums behind you and the bass over there and like some mm -hmm. aspects of the way that we're dealing with that in the early days didn't work. But I think like Bridget's saying, if you have most of the music doing its normal thing and then there's little parts drifting around, like, you know, the drum feel all of a sudden goes around your head and you're like, whoa, like that would be cool. You know, there's some, there's some definitely some fun things that have happened. I don't know, Drew from Avid has um, shown us some amazing um, music mixes in Atmos in the space that we have. And it was just insane hearing synthesizers dance around the room and go over your head. It was just killer. But drums and bass and all that was still mostly locked down the front because it feels normal, you know. Yeah, so... Yeah, where, where can it go? Who knows? We don't know what we don't know, do we? You know, so. Lots of potential, <laughs> that's the way I'd look at it. Yeah. 
No, yeah. nice. Um, yeah, we don't know where it's going to go, but I mean, some of the stuff we've seen, um, or at least heard whispers about, it, it sounds pretty cool. I love the, the idea of surround sound. I think I was talking to someone the other day and they were like, yeah, Dolby Atmos in your car. And I was like, I feel like that could be dangerous. <laughs> like Atmos yeah. surround yeah. sound while you're driving? Probably not, no. Be good um, for a drive, drive-in theater. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, could if be. It's a, if it's a self-driving car, then does it matter? Mm? Yeah. No. <laughs> Might as well. Um, yeah. But here's a here's another quick question, Lana and Talia. I think a couple of people um, have asked now, where where are you? What location are you at? What studio is it? I think it looks pretty pretty cool. And I know Glenn's in the background there, who's who's specked it out. So <laughs> yeah, um, we're at Deluxe um, in Deluxe Stage One in Sydney in Lane Cove. Mm-hmm. So yes, we have a big um, sound stage here. Which if we flipped you around, you'd see the the cine- like the um, projector screen um back here you can see the couches where you know if we had clients that's where they would be um so yes it's a lovely room yeah it's a beautiful room yeah and it's had a lot of iconic films come through it so yes no it's a great space i've uh, i've been lucky enough to to visit glenn there myself and it is uh, the couches are really comfortable <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um all right. Uh, I, I mean, Jason, I, I've been asking a couple of questions here. We've got a couple more. I don't know if you've seen any in particular that you're kind of keen on answering. Because um, um, I know we are running out of time and I, I don't want to keep you guys longer than kind of going 30 minutes over. So thanks everyone for, for staying on. I know a couple of students have like lectures and classes and all that kind of stuff to, to jump to. Um, actually, just quick one. Shout out to Glenn Ferguson, who's been typing uh, some great some great comments in the chat. He's got one here about, you know, impressing your lectures and um, with your work ethic because you never know what they know. And I think in the industry, sometimes there can be hidden jobs. So it's like if things aren't always advertised, it can be word of mouth as well. So, and again, I think that goes back to just being personal, just being, a, you know, a rock solid person and and nice um, and, and getting on in the industry. Um, so, yeah, just just be a good person. I think that's a very good piece of advice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I, that's pretty much how I yeah. got into the industry. Yeah. Just um, it was definitely showing my lecturers that I was dedicated and uh, impressed them to the point where they they wanted to introduce me to yeah. someone who was in the industry. So I'd say that's the first stepping stone. Definitely. Even all my freelance sound short films that I've done, it's literally just all word of mouth. Someone's heard me from somewhere about how awesome I worked on their film. So mm. um, uh, obviously I do do some cold calling still to get some work in but at the same time I'm you know I get contacted so yeah and once you're in the industry you know you if you're working with a client and they're impressed with what you do because mm-hmm. of those reasons they're gonna a hire you again and b recommend you to the people they know so that yeah. they can hire you yeah yeah nice so yeah Jason um is there any more there's an interesting one there from Diana or yeah, I'm just having a look through them now. So um, as someone who's about to finish a film and television degree, how important is it to have studied sound specifically? And could I get into the industry with a film and television degree? Um, I think like Talia and Lana, you might be best to answer that one. Um, I would say it's possible, but it would be good to do some sound. What do you think? Yeah, I would say at least get the basics. Um, again, understand your signal flow. Maybe, I don't know if I don't know what exactly is involved with a a TV. What was it? TV and commercial? Film, was, film and television. Film degree. and television. Um, if you can do an elective in sound, at least that would be great. Um, again, if you're wanting to focus more on sound, like like film, audio, post, uh, learn as much as you can about Pro Tools and about your signal flow. Because as I was saying earlier, um, anyone... Uh, who's in the industry is probably too busy to teach that. But if you can go, I've got this basic understanding of of audio and I sort of know how to use Pro Tools. Like I know I can set up a bit of a session and I I know some shortcuts, the basic ones, Mm -hmm. and they can, okay, sure. Like if you've got the right attitude, they'll be like, yeah, sure. Come and hang out for a day or, or whatever. Like that's, that's probably a minimum base knowledge. I'd say definitely invest possibly in a sound post dedicated course I think because um you need some sort of knowledge I think to be able to get into you know this post-production area because like you said not no one's 
necessarily got the time to sit down and teach you everything that you need to know. So you need to come in with some sort of basic understanding and understanding film and television, I guess, as a concept is great. But of that audio is same with video, I suppose, if that's something you want to hone in on, um, go out and explore what you can learn, whether it be online mm. courses, doing a degree, um, whatever it is. So. Yeah, I, I also feel like this could um, relate to Joshua's question, which is about like, you know, obviously with COVID, um, reducing the amount of connections you can make. And obviously, apart from the ASSG, that, um, you know, how can you make those connections? I think, well, in the meantime, if you've done film and television, or if you're struggling to make connections, then use this time to develop your skills, like, you know, get Pro Tools, replace the sound for a film, you know, like, use this time to actually get proactive in developing what you need to be able to get into the industry yeah. so that you do have a good show reel when there's a chance to be able to present it to someone that so that you can email that out and you have those base skills it's sort of partly answering both of those i think and it's, mm. you've got so many resources available online that you can self-teach yourself this stuff um mm -hmm. not that i'm saying it, going to a degree is not helpful and useful because it is because that's kind of where the basis of your contacts start um, but you can learn so much online. So That's definitely true. delve into that online courses, even YouTube videos, you know, there's so much information out there. So go, go learn it. Yeah. And actually yeah. replacing the sound for a, a film is a, a really yeah. good, um, project. If you have the time, do that because <laughs> yeah. it's a lot, it's a lot harder of than what you would yeah. have thought. Yeah. Design, no, aspect, that is a good creativity, thing. Foley effects, mm, yeah. background atmos. Yeah. You know, replacing dialogue if you want to do that, doing some bad lip sync. Yeah. <laughs> or good lip sync. <laughs> and you can have some fun with it as well, can't you? You can, yeah. you know, you, yeah, you can literally, yeah. You can change, like, make, change the make, soundscape. Make, yeah. Mm. Completely yeah. change it to what it originally was. So it might be some serious drama film that you're doing and you turn it into a comedy. Mm. And that can really showcase your skills, definitely. Yeah. Mm. And, I, and as you're saying, you know, there's a bunch of content online, like for instance, I know LinkedIn Learning, there's courses you can do up on there. Um, for instance, with Avid, we've got a whole YouTube series. So say if you are in film, um, we've got a bunch of tips and trick videos on Media Composer, same as Pro Tools, same as Sibelius, if you're on the more of the composing side. Um, YouTube is a great resource. And then, um, yeah, LinkedIn Learning, I, I would suggest, especially if say, you're doing an audio degree or you've just done a video degree, or film and TV degree, as um, Diana mentioned, if you kind of just want to learn a little bit about Pro Tools or, or, or kind of any DAW, check it out on YouTube and just start doing some work throughs. There's free trials for say Avid, so you can get a 30 day free trial and test it out and do some online courses kind of thing with that and see how you feel. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to take it further, as Lana mentioned, just smash out a degree, um, <laughs> which isn't as easy as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but you know, it, that's, that's, I think the best way to really upskill and, and kind of add more under your belt. Um, mm. but for the time being, if you just want to get started, um, go with that. And then if you really like it, definitely look at doing a degree. There's a bunch of great universities around Australia. So, yeah. Yeah. And a lot of those degrees have a, you can, you know, sign up for the diploma and then if you want articulate into the degree, so you might, you know, find yourself starting a smaller version of that degree just to see how, what you think about it. And, you know, sometimes students leave early because they've got work in the industry because even of just that, you know, a couple of trimesters or a couple of semesters. So, you know, mm. yeah, dive in. Awesome. I think oh, this is, you know, the, the whole, uh, no, none that I can see. I think we're sort of essentially answering these. Um, like Brian's question about, um, is it important to set up the audio first before recording while working in the industry? I'm a little challenged to understand exactly what that question means. Music production and sound engineering student, is it important to set up the audio first before recording while working in the industry? We need a couple, a bit more detail. Um, mm -hmm. Brian, if you're still on the, or if you're still on the webinar, uh, feel free to send me an email at shauna.purcell um at avid.com yeah. um and just with a couple more details and i'm able to forward that off to some of the guest speakers and that goes for anyone here um on the webinar if you do have any questions or you've got you know a particular topic in mind or anything like that that you want to do follow up with after the webinar feel free to shoot me an email um more than happy to, to answer that awesome 
Otherwise, I definitely feel like we've covered a lot. Like I've learned a few really good hot tips today. I think it's been really good, you know, getting, you know, students to industry. I mean, that's the name of, the, of this webinar. And I think it's been a really good discussion on how to get students into the industry and, you know, some real life experiences happening here. So it's been really good. Yeah, thank no, you. Definitely. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for having us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, yes, not to thank much. you to, to everyone here. So that is Talia and Lana over there in Deluxe in the cool studio everyone keeps talking about. Also Bridget. And then, of course, we've got Jason, who's been our host today. Um, again, thank you all for taking the time. I, I've definitely learned some stuff as well. Um, and I think a lot we're getting a lot of positive comments from the students here as well and teachers, which is great. So, yeah. And Jason, as you mentioned, that's the point of these webinars. It's, um, it's students to industry. It's being able to provide, you know, that tips and tricks, insider knowledge, um, let people kind of ask the questions that maybe they haven't had the chance to ask someone in the industry yet. That's, uh, that's what we want to do. Um, and on that note, we've got another webinar coming up for students in industry. Like I've said, these are a series of events. I think the next one, we're going to be joined by um, Gurev, who is our, one of our pre-sales guys over in the UK. And he's going to be doing, you know, how to make, um, kind of how to produce music from home. So from a home studio, how to make beats in Pro Tools. That's going to be an interesting session there, a bit more hands-on. Um, but yeah, apart from that, that's that's all I've got. So any final thoughts or comments from you guys? Just work hard, go for yeah. it. Yeah, work <laughs> hard, great work ethic and make those contacts and make yourself known, I think. It's, yeah. you, know, you will get there. It's a, it can be a long journey and it can be a hard one, but you will get there. Yeah. Great nice. point. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Beautiful. Thank oh, you. Nice. Guys. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Right. Have a great day. Hey. Yeah, Bye. Bye.